Okay. Awesome. Hey, everyone. Welcome to our presentation, Housing Becomes Home, Fostering Care, Encourage, and Residential Communities. Before we begin, I wanted to start with an acknowledgement of the land that we live, work, and learn on. Um, we're communing today and coming to you all from Central Florida. Um, so we wanna acknowledge that these are the original homelands of the Timucua and Seminole tribal nations. Um, we acknowledge the painful history of colonization and forced removal from these lands. And we honor and respect the many ways that the work we do is influenced from their presence here in Central Florida. Um, we want to also acknowledge the indigenous peoples that are still connected to this land. And we hope that we can gather and present to you all today wanting to acknowledge that history from where we come from. So we will go ahead and get started. Um, starting with who are we? So my name is Brianna Jenkins. Um, I use she, her, hers pronouns. I'm the Assistant Director for Residence Life and Education at the University of Central Florida located in sunny Orlando. All right. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Gabby Dixon. Um, she, her, her pronouns. Um, and I am a student care coordinator in our student care services office on campus at UCF. Yes, absolutely. So welcome, everyone. So we're going to start a little bit with the why. What are you going to get out of this presentation? So our hope is by the end of our time together, you will be able to identify and support the relationship between housing and case management offices on your campus, really strengthening those partnerships. We hope you'll be able to identify at least one way that you can build a collaborative partnership on your campus. We um, hope that you'll be able to identify at least one shift in partnership from pre-COVID to post-COVID, since that has been a lot of um, the past year for everyone. And um, we hope that you'll be able to leverage technology to support your partnerships. So now we wanna make sure we provide an overview of our offices. So I'll allow Gabby to start. Okay, um, so like I said, I am a care coordinator with our student care services office, which is a non-clinical case management office, um, and it consists of approximately six case managers and an office assistant um, when everything staffing-wise is going according to plan, um, which as we know um, in this day and age can be a little topsy-turvy. Um, and so what we have people from um, student affairs background, counseling, social work, a variety of different backgrounds, um, and we each have our own um, group of students that we work directly with. Um, we receive reports from all over campus in that student of concern and form that's mentioned in the PowerPoint. And with students as well, um, a lot of times our students are having a requirement to meet with us and there are instances where they do not. Um, and so anybody can put one of those referral forms in a community member, a fellow student, um, or a staff member. And we do have over 70,000 students through UCF right now, so that's something to keep in mind. Um, and then for those six case managers that we house in our office, um, each of those have a different specialty area um, that they focus on. So whether that is financial need, um, mental health related cases, um, and so uh, Title IX, and then specifically my position is in partnership with housing. Um, so that means that I um, do some of the caseload as far as students that are coming from housing or have a connection there um, that we want to use this partnership for. But also on top of that, we do take have cases from all over. So I so we'll see a financial need or mental health. Um, but specifically, this partnership is one of my key areas. And so like I mentioned earlier, um, I work for Housing and Residence Life here at the University of Central Florida. Um, our main focus is our curricular approach to residential learning. So we focus largely on intentional conversations, um, focusing on restoring and repairing Maslow's hierarchy of needs with our residents. And we have a community living guide that governs a majority of our interactions with students and governs the reactions of students with each other. So that's our main crux within the Department of Residence Life which is where I work. 
Um, our staffing model, uh, like Gabby mentioned, um, there are 70,000 campus students. Um, in housing, we have 13 residential communities with approximately 12,000 students. Um, and so our staffing model is a little different. We have 56 professional and paraprofessional staff in residence life and education. Um, the majority of those are actually graduate students and graduate coordinators. So um, we have the 13 residential communities, our um, 13 coordinators for residence life and education, and the remainder of that is graduate students. We also have 300 residence assistants who also support this model um, and do a lot of the peer-to-peer -peer interactions that support our curricular approach. As a part of this process and this partnership, our main responsibility is doing staff outreach and follow-up. And so we'll talk a little bit more about that later in the presentation, but for our purposes, this is one of the main components of our residential curriculum and allows us to support our students in that way. So as we talk about this partnership, we kind of want to go back and talk a little bit about the history. Um, our president, um, our former president who left the university in 2018, really wanted to encourage and cultivate that UCF is collaboration. Um, our division, our, uh, which is the Division of Student Development and Enrollment Services, um, our priority is to make the university feel smaller. Um, so with 70,000 students, how does that happen? You know, most days, sometimes, most days, not at all, right? Um, but we wanna be high touch. Um, we want when a student reaches out to a staff member to be able to cultivate that student's issue or work with that student from start to finish and work more for a referral system after you're able to triage and support the student with what they are experiencing. But as always, we know that growth with the campus means that there is growth of responsibility. Our university was established in 1968 and it's 2021. So we have not even reached the 100 year mark of our institution and our initial enrollment was 1000 students. So we have grown from 1000 students to 70,000 students in a relatively short time in the, in the context of higher education. But we know with that growth of responsibility, that does not mean a growth in staff and resources. So our staffing structure means that we have to consistently focus on this collaboration to accomplish the goals and support our students in the way that is that they need to be. So there is a desired need for additional care and support with students who are experiencing difficulty or crises. So our divisional leadership has said that it is our goal to make sure that if students are in need or have crisis, they're able to get that support from our staff. We follow the UCF creed, which is our governing tenets of integrity, scholarship, community, creativity, and excellence. Those things designate and support the work that we do. We have an elective Carnegie classification of community engagement. And so those partnerships, again, are the crux of the work that we do. Um, in terms of our partnership, we are classified under well-being, which is one under one of those tenants and is how we kind of guide our work, making sure our students are focused on their own well-being and utilizing others to, to support them in those goals. Um, our collaboration falls under the student of concern team. So Gabby will talk a little bit more about that in terms of behavioral intervention and how that original group kind of offshoot our partnership between housing and student care services. Um, so we've been working together officially in this partnership um, since mid-spring 2019. Um, so February of 2019 is when we officially cemented and created this partnership because we saw from our Student of Concern team that there was an additional need for consistent follow-up and communication because a lot of the students that were coming through that behavioral intervention team were residential students. Um, so obviously this indicates a human resource investment, right? So our powers at B said, hey, we need to make sure that there is one person in each office dedicated to this partnership. And it also allowed us to clarify our standards of practice and response. How will we respond to students that live on campus who are experiencing significant crises or may need a little coaching to help them through some of life's issues? So in thinking of that, we wanted to also talk about our goals when this partnership was created. So 
our goals were pre-COVID. We started in February 2019. So yes, there was a time without COVID that we want to acknowledge that this partnership started under. Um, originally, we had some administrative processes that started um, as a part of this partnership. And so one of those was our homelessness waiver process and support. For students who are experiencing homelessness, they are routed through student care services, and we will support them with a waiver to um, live on campus or provide that additional support for students so that they are able to determine standard um, and stable housing. We also have a students of concern follow up in process. So when a student of concern is reported to student care services, there is a form that faculty, staff, and other students can fill out to go to student care services. If that student is a residential student, at that time, our staff would follow up based on student care services recommendation. So if the care manager in student care services, Gabby mostly, <laughs> um, or another um, staff member in that uh, department said that they wanted our staff to follow up, we would. Um, and so we have levels for that follow up. If it just needs kind of a check-in, if the student just really needs some additional support, someone to speak to, we have our student staff level follow-up, which is that intentional conversation, or we call it a door knock. Um, you know, knocking on the door saying, hey, just wanted to check in with you. How are you doing? How can we help you? Um, if there are acute crises, so let's say a student referred another student, and for some reason, Gabby and her team weren't able to get in touch with that student, our staff would do a door knock and say, hey, we've, we want to check in. This is what's going on. We care about you. We want to support you. How can we assist? And so all of our student level staff are trained in QPR, question, persuade, respond, which is that threat assessment for students with self-harm and suicide ideation and get them some help, right? Refer and resource, call up to their staff and make sure that we are able to assess that student and at least lay eyes, I like to say, on the student. Um, my grandma has a saying, you know, somebody just needs to reach out and touch you. That's what I like to tell my students. Somebody just needs to reach out and say, hey, you okay? You're here? Great. We want to make sure that you are being well and that we can support your well-being. There's also professional staff follow-up. So let's say a student may need a professional staff member that's trained a little bit more in student inter intervention and interaction. We have our staff on campus that will do some wellness coaching you know, hey, you're experiencing these things. Maybe we need to go to CAPS, which is our counseling service together. Maybe we need to meet with student care services together to make sure that we're getting you the coaching that you need. We also do resource referrals. So if a student is having a medical crisis, we assist them with talking with student health services. We also will assist them with resources if there are financial issues, if they're having issues with their housing and residence life, we will meet with student care services staff and basically share all the info we can on those students. We also will do a minor level of threat assessment, which really includes, but is not limited to when we know that there is a threat, we involve university police. So we have specific policies and protocols um, to ensure the wellness of our, staff, of our staff and our students, as well as make sure that student care services is in the loop and can do that mandatory clinical assessment or get that student that mandatory clinical assessment. So with also pre-COVID, we wanted to make sure that there was an open flow of communication, right? So Gabby and I met weekly um, in person, typically before or after our um, Student of Concern team meetings to really just talk to the students that were on the caseload. Who is it that we need to follow up with? How can we coordinate that follow-up? And what makes the most sense for the students in that moment? This allowed for streamlined training and joint processes. So our goal was to make sure that as we had these joint meetings, we also made sure there were joint processes to provide unified messaging to students and staff. It also allowed for students and staff to have access to each other. So for example, my team knew that Gabby is our liaison. So if there's an issue in their building or a student that they have concerns about, they know they can reach out to Gabby or reach out to student care services and facilitate that partnership quicker rather than just sending a student over to student care services. We really wanted to make sure that we filled those gaps in outreach and really fostered a home for the student. We wanted to know that students felt like they could come to somebody in housing and residence life and share their concerns or things that they were experiencing and be able to follow up with those things. We really wanted to establish a culture of care and courage. 
We wanted to demystify the helper. Everyone needs a little help sometimes. And what we found is that our students were less willing to reach out and ask for that help because they were afraid of student care services. That must mean that I need care or coordinator for residence life and education. That means that I'm in trouble instead of reaching out and asking for that help. So we really wanted to focus on demystifying that process and really demystifying the stigma of reaching out if you need some mental health support and care. We also wanted to publicize what happens when students need support. Sometimes because we are so large, it can feel like students are kind of lost in the sauce. There's no support or they feel like there's just a pool of students and they don't know what to do. We wanted to put that out there and say, yes, this is what happens when you reach out and say we need support. This is who we liaise with, student care services. No, you're not in trouble. This is for us to make sure that you can be referred to the resources that you need and determine, help you determine what you might need and be able to navigate those things um, yourself. We grew through it. So when I first got here in February, um, there was Gabby's predecessor and I, we were trying to figure out what does this look like? What makes the most sense for us? How do we maintain the integrity of our two separate offices where there's sometimes medical records involved, where there's sometimes other things, but also make sure that we're providing a consistent process for our students. So we grew through it and are still growing through it, especially as the pandemic has hit, to be able to make sure that we're providing the best services for our students. All right, so um, we, we wanted one, this, this meme is, I mean, it's everywhere, but it's also very true um, to us figuring this out. Um, and oddly enough, with something that student care services, and um, we also have an outreach arm, which is called UCF Cares. I forgot to mention that part, um, which I also um, operate within. And we actually used this graphic prior to the pandemic to explain and do that demystifying of the help arm. And so, um, and talking through just needing that help. And then it became so crucial again when we hit COVID um, and looking through what that shift in goals needed to look like as we moved into the pandemic and both of our roles um, within care services and housing really shifted quite a bit. Um, so we can go ahead and that's part. So um, just a little bit about kind of what that looked like. So as Brianna mentioned, um, we were having face-to-face -face communication previously. Um, we had meetings in our office, you know, pick up the phone. Um, from one office to another and just dial an extension um, and we went remote. So um, that communication chain need, needed to adjust. Um, so learning how to utilize all the technology that we had at hand to be able to make sure that we were having consistent communication that was easy for both of us. Um, and so um, that was something that we had to, to start looking to figure out what was our target ways of doing communication, what was gonna work for both of us. And um, we also needed to realize that this was going to become a more complex partnership. Before, it was really Brianna and I talking back and forth and my predecessor um, also talking back and forth um, and having maybe one or two other individuals involved. Um, but now we had isolation and quarantine protocols to contend with and specific individuals that were meeting with that. And as the housing person, I was also our response um, on our care side for that COVID response um, on campus and at, the at that time off campus as well. So we needed to realize that there were going to be more people involved in that partnership and looking at what that was going to look like and how we were going to engage in that and still have that clear communication through it and expand that network of who we knew because sometimes, you know, I'm not going to be in the office every day and Brianna can't be in the office every day. And so we need to make sure that there's someone in person and remote um, that we could contact through that. Um, our goal is just to continue tracking what those different trends um, and problems that we were seeing where were those gaps, that, especially because we had new gaps that were coming up that we never anticipated with the pandemic. So um, try and gauge those early. And if we didn't gauge them early, do that follow through with that student to, to address those needs in that moment and learn for the next time. Um, and seeing what those trends were, what were the resources that we needed? What other partnerships did we need to bring into this? Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about what that looked like um, as we go along as well. Um, and as you all know, there's always this push for new. So while we're adjusting to the pandemic, we still needed to have new initiatives happening on campus. We still needed to do new things with a partnership. Um, you know, it's, it's, it was still a learning process for that. Um, and so figuring out how do we do new 
um, without reinventing the wheel and without overdoing ourselves to in the middle of a pandemic um, was one of our goals, was just trying to figure out how do we do this, do it better, and do it right. Um, and then also realizing that that need for support and what that looked like for our students was vastly changing during the pandemic. And so what does that support need to look like? Um, what does that communication look like? Which partnerships do we need? Um, so really this goes back to that evolving process um, that really happened during the pandemic and we all felt it, we all lived it, um, we're still going through it. Um, and so really during the, the, through this pandemic, we've really looked at the goal of just trying to, to handle all those pieces that we come up, see them early and continue addressing them um, with these things kind of in mind. So we had to get organized, right? <laughs> Instead of shifting to the pandemic and now working remotely and maybe not being able to do the level of service that we needed to do, we had to get organized and we had to get creative. How are we going to deliver the same support options and mechanisms to students who were in need? And like Gabby said, that support definition changed. What students needed before the pandemic obviously is exacerbated and highlighted by the lack of access to services outside the university, right? So we had to change our isolation response and engagement. So when students now um, were isolated, we had to change our delivery mechanisms to those students, provide additional access. Um, and these are just some examples. We had what's called busy bags, which um, Gabby is going to talk about in a little bit, um, that really supported our students. Calendars with virtual engagement opportunities to kind of break down that isolation um, experience, um, just like we would do for students pre-pandemic who were maybe feeling a little isolated and needed support. We were now needing to do that virtually, at a distance, and for students, and make sure that they have the access to those opportunities. Um, Gabby can talk about pharmacy delivery. You know, we have a pharmacy on campus, so that is a resource that we have to support students. So making sure that delivery is able to be done. Food access, we worked with our pantry on campus to provide food, and you'll see a photo of that listed there, and I'll allow Gabby to just to speak about that as well, and really fill the gap for our students. Um, and then for students who weren't in isolation, we had social media engagement and distanced outreach. We gave away, what was it, 1,200 t-shirts? Like a lot of so, t-shirts. A, a lot of t-shirts um, that we made available in our community offices for students to just come pick up and leave, right? Um, we handed it out during the move-ins that we had because, you know, just because we're in a pandemic doesn't mean we don't have move-in, right? Right? We handed those things out. We did giveaway drives. We had our staff driving around on golf carts to give out t-shirts and make sure that they could um, let meet students where they were. We did social media takeovers where we had student care services come in and take over the housing and residence life social media pages. Um, we did in-room engagement. We have a um, video streaming service that's called Nightflix, kind of like Netflix, but nights, Netflix, and we put student care services information up there and let it run for two weeks, right? Um, we were meeting students via Zoom. We have um, My Night Star, which is our advisor portal, where advisors were sending um, pings over to our staff for students that maybe weren't going to class or things like that. So we were able to then engage that way. We built that new partnership with advising. We met students where they were, which for a lot of them was in their rooms on Zoom all the time, right? So making sure that we are doing that. Um, and then of course, continued case connection. We still met, we had partner meetings very frequently, sometimes multiple times a week, <laughs> um, just picking up the phone. We really broke down the wall of picking up the phone and calling each other and saying, hey, this is something we need. Um, Gabby and I started communicating via cell phone. We never really had a need to do that before the pandemic, but we now do, right? Um, texting, saying, can we follow up with this thing? Um, because it just connected us more and allowed us to keep those partner meetings going and relying on the technology that we have, um, which is um, Maxient and <laughs> OneDrive, which we'll talk about a little bit later to really support our partnership. And so I'll allow Gabby to talk a little bit more, more about the busy bags and our night's pantry response with our students. Yeah, so um, just a little bit, you know, more detail about some of those different things. So um, the busy bags, um, when we talk about that partnership that we really needed to have that collaboration on campus, the busy bags literally started 
as an email chain that went out to uh, like 10 different campus partners stating what different giveaway items do you have that is you think a student in isolation and quarantine would be interested in? Tell me how many you can get me and I will pick it up. Um, and so that's literally how it started was picking up items um, from all these different partners, um, some of their different flyers that they had, flyers that we had, um, and at one point putting them together um, at one point it was in my guest room, having a space just to throw stuff together um, and to get to students um, to make sure that they had that same support options. Um, that evolved and luckily um, one of our campus partners, which is our um, these, this leadership office, which is called LEAD, um, you'll see kind of their sticker in there. They um, had some additional funds that a lot of us didn't have at that point. And so they said, hey, let's figure out some things that we can do. Our student leaders are looking for opportunities and need some hours. We'll put it together. We'll get it to you. Um, so they would get their information together. They shifted it to us. Um, and then my office put together additional resource information, um, helped with that calendar. So that calendar could also go in those bags directly as well. And then um, it had everything from a game to a mask to, to bars of soap and Kleenexes and um, things to keep them busy, but also things to make sure that they were taking care of themselves and reminders about uh, not only their physical health, but their mental health. Um, so we had these little, little good decks, um, and as Brianna mentioned, that being able to pick up the phone um, it was a lot of times um, Brianna and I were on campus on different dates. So it was picking up the phone and saying, okay, I have three boxes today to drop off. Can we shut them somewhere in your office or can we shut them in a conference room? Um, or directing other people who hadn't necessarily been to one of our offices to get there um, to make sure that those things got dropped off as well. Um, but it was something that really worked within our partnership. We got really good feedback from students um, on that engagement piece um, and was something that prior to the pandemic, we would have never probably thought of. Um, so that was something that was really interesting that forged out of this partnership. And then the two other campus partners that we really worked with a lot through this is the pharmacy and Knight's Pantry. So um, the second picture, so the first picture on the slide um, to the right, up top right, is um, what was some of the items in that isolation bag. And then the second picture is some of the items that are in those Knight's Pantry bags. So part of our follow-up response for um, students in quarantine or isolation is a call from our office to the student who, and checking in to see, you know, how they're doing, questions, concerns but also seeing what is their access to food looking like. Um, and so we worked with housing if they needed to sign up for a meal delivery service, then they got shifted over with housing and housing was able to walk them through that process. If they needed a uh, pantry bag, then they would receive items similar to what's in that picture um, in a bag and it was things that they could make within their space that they were isolated in. Um, and so that would come through our office get sent over to housing and they would get those delivered and the pantry kept that supply running. Um, so we were really uh, supported through that effort and it also helped for our students who weren't able to, they also had a grocery option, but a lot of times students weren't anticipating that expense. And so we were able to supplement them or if a student couldn't get that order in time or something was delaying their process, we could pick up the phone and say, I need a pantry bag delivered tonight. Um, and that was able to be facilitated. And then the pharmacy was something also didn't see coming. Um, and luckily we have a pharmacy on our campus. Um, and so we were able to work with the pharmacy um, to get those delivered to us. So I actually became their um, on-call person during our work hours to be able to give a call over, let us know that student information for me to make sure we had a record of that student and also being able to make sure that we connected with housing, were able to tell them how they needed to deliver, was it something directly to the door, or if there was something that um, we needed to, you know, to facilitate with that. So I was able to message directly to Brianna and say, hey, like, Cindy Lou who needs this pharmacy uh, thing, you know, here's what, you know, here's the information I know that you need to know, can we make sure that this happens today? Um, and so we really utilized that partnership a lot through that. Um, it was really interesting to see how that evolution happened uh, um, because that also included more people than Rihanna and I. We had a whole team of COVID response as well. Um, and so that was really interesting. And then another piece that I wanted just to highlight is on that distance outreach piece. Another component of that was in trying to make sure people knew that partnership for all the boxes of t-shirts that got dropped off 
Um, luckily, because of our partnership and knowing some of the people in housing, I literally had another housing staff member who was able to come along with me and make sure that I met each of the different coordinators um, for that momentary interaction when we were both on campus. Or if they didn't, they saw someone in that office, saw who I was to know who we could do that. So um, being able to have those connections or we were able to do tables. Um, so our office still did outreach um, just very strategically. Um, and so being able to work with housing to actually have also a table um, that went outside and everything for a period of time while we were remote um, on our social media. Didn't ever think that I was going to become a social media like face person for our university, but it happened. Uh, and so um, being able to have that moment to of making sure that our faces were also visible because they weren't necessarily coming into our spaces to see us in person too. Yeah, so, so those are the things that we did and how we had to alter our partnership to make sure that we were providing the same level of consistency and support that we had offered pre-pandemic um, and really change that. So here's what the future looks like for us. Um, and I'll talk first about for my side of the house, um, which is residence life and education. It's really about informing our residential procedures and policies, utilizing a care structure in mind. So understanding that if an RA is doing an intentional conversation, how are they also integrating questions about support, access, um, and maybe things that we don't think about in a pandemic. Um, we typically ask about the roommate relationship in our intentional conversations and roommate agreements, but now it was editing those questions to more say, do you have a private space to talk about or and have class? Do you have a private space to have therapy or to speak with your counselor if you're doing so? Um, and if not, how are you going to open those conversations up to your roommate? How are you going to open those conversations up with student care services? And we've seen a lot of students take advantage of that, but really integrating those things into our residential policies and procedures, making sure that when staff are outreaching to students, that they are really cognizant of the different vectors of mental wellness that could affect that student's reaction with them. So just making sure that they're, know, they're um, understanding and knowing of all of those different aspects and how they cross with us. Um, it's about informing our curricular approach. Um, if our goal is to teach students and that students will learn, um, how are we approaching that differently during this pandemic, right? So making sure that we're utilizing our partnership between student care services and housing to inform our curricular approach. Um, the virtual engagements and, and doing Netflix, um, and posting that information on social media and Netflix, um, we see that a lot of students were engaging with that. So how are we assessing that student learning? And like, is it super, and, and this, might, this might be a little taboo, but is it super important that we're trying new stuff all the time? Can we just really look at what we do well? Can we really focus on what it is that students are latching onto? And if students are on social media, it's okay to not have that in-person student program that focuses on wellness if students are on social media and engaging with us in that way. Um, so that is something that we really wanted to focus on is, um, and is really looking at what the nature of those interactions are virtually and making sure that those inform our curricular approaches. Um, being willing to say, which we had to do this year, you know what, curriculum is just not pre-built for a pandemic right now. So why don't we go back to the drawing board and reevaluate how we're engaging with students about their mental health and wellness to be able to clarify our outreach further. Um, so it's okay to just say, hmm, this ain't the best year for this right now. Let's reevaluate and be able to really make informed decisions. And then it's about our outreach. How are we outreaching to residents in the pandemic? We really learned the value of a simple door knock, of a door knock and a drop. Um, even that distance interaction sometimes was the difference for some students between feeling incredibly isolated and incredibly not thought of to being reconnected and engaged with our university. So that was something that we really are hoping to to continue to build on in the future and integrate into our policies that it doesn't necessarily have to be the formal interactions. We really wanna invest more in the informal interactions and the spur of the moment things that really support our students. 
Um, so on my side, um, so one of the things too that Brianna and I wanted to do when we thought about the future too is also think of them separately. So you're going to hear some of it echoed um, between um, both of us as well. So you could see how that process also works with us thinking through things and coming together on that. Um, so we've talked a lot about that communication and how it shifted in that. Um, and I think through this process, we've also figured out ways that that communication is also strengthened um, through this process um, and are things that even post-pandemic um, should potentially be in place um, to make sure that we have that smooth of the piece, especially knowing that housing is unpredictable and sometimes so is case management. And so um, sometimes if it can be sent in an email or shared in a OneDrive um, and, you know, we may not get a meeting that week or it may have to get shortened to, you know, a 15 minute, okay, here are the nitty gritty details um, and this is all we've got. Um, so being able to have that continued communication. Um, as Rihanna mentioned, that strategic piece of knowing Yes, we're getting a push to do new things, but instead of trying to create something new and do, you know, a whole new initiative, maybe it's making sure that we have that intentional, um, someone put in the chat, quality over quantity. So, um, yeah, making sure that we're using that piece, um, that we're creating that quality content that is getting to students where they are at, um, instead of just continuing to put things out just to put things out. Um, for training and development, um, making sure that we have that piece um, from both of our offices, getting continually trained and updated on what each of our processes is going on, what we're talking about. Brianna and I have been doing a lot of this here lately, especially on new things that are happening. And so making sure that we kind of come up with a plan or check in points so that we make sure that we're always on the same page um, moving forward and that both of our departments continue to do that as well. Um, and then the allies integration. So same thing um, or very similar is making sure that we're always on that same page so that when a student comes to one of us, they are able to have that smooth transition to the other one and back and forth um, with how they're needed. And so that way we're not seen necessarily as two different entities, but a united front, um, which I think went very smoothly um, at times when we were doing some of our case management because you know, we'd have a student who was needing a door knock and we're, I'm able to reach out to Brianna and say, hey, I need this door knock. And she's able to loop in with me. And then a couple days later, I'm able to meet with a student and they're like, yeah, I actually just talked to, you know, someone from housing the other day and we're going, great. That's what, you know, we'd love to hear that, you know, continue that engagement in here. We're going to talk about your resources. Um, so being able to have that piece where not only are we working as allies, but also the student are seeing us as allies. Um, and seeing that integration across both our offices and other offices um, within our division and our university. Okay, so um, um, for considerations, um, so there's just a couple things and thinking through how this applies to you all um, and how to the takeaways of this, um, wanted to make sure that um, we take a second to also acknowledge some of the things that we are working within. Um, so we want to mention that environment because we know that those environments look vastly different um, in different areas and there's some things to consider in how things played out. Um, so one, considering the fact that we do have designated people, that doesn't always happen, um, or where those designations occur looks a little bit differently. I know of case managers that are actually housed in housing. I know of housing offices that don't have a case manager. Um, so that's something that we wanted to acknowledge is that we do have someone dedicated on each side of things. So that's what has helped with this partnership. There are obviously ways to work around that as well. Um, we wanted to make sure we acknowledge the fact too that we have a lot of technology services that we have been able to utilize and utilize a lot through this process. So um, we use Maxient um, for our um, student of concern forms, um, for some of our communication back and forth. We have a OneDrive, um, which um, we had done shared drives and things like that in the past for our office, um, but the OneDrive has become my best friend over the last um, year. Um, and so Brianna and I actually have specifically a housing folder that everything that we need to communicate is able to be in there. So if something happened where we couldn't meet or I need to just communicate something briefly, we could send you know, a quick message, hey, in the OneDrive and someone knew where to look. Um, we have Skype um, that we have up regularly, um, so we're able to utilize that um, for communication. We use our Outlook on a regular basis um, all the time. Um, and then also we do utilize Microsoft Teams as well. So when we were having some of those 
larger partnerships happening between both of our offices, we did utilize that as a technology service available. Um, Brianna also mentioned um, some of the other different, I lost my words for a second, um, mentioned how we've been utilizing um, all these different services and all the different um, outreach things as well, as far as Instagram and the Netflix and things like that, that we were able to utilize. So super reliant on technology, as I feel like a lot of us did um, in the last year. Um, and hopefully moving forward. And then also a uh, consideration is that staff size looks different um, on each of our campuses. Um, it looks different sometimes in the moment um, versus two weeks from now. So um, that's something also to consider when you're thinking about these different partnerships um, and how you can formulate that is what, what is the staff size you have and what is your own personal capacity to be able to do that. Um, so one piece too, I realized that we didn't really share is going to be talked about. So I had a predecessor for this. I switched into this position um, literally kind of as we shifted into pandemic mode um, and then officially transitioned into this role in um, June of 2020. So um, that's just something too that I realized it's kind of remiss in not mentioning. Um, so that's something to consider too is like what is your capacity and where at in that transition are the different partners that you're trying to work with. So Brianna knew that coming, you know, when we started working together, that sometimes still to this day, every once in a while, there's something that I realized that I didn't quite understand how something was set up or um, the background. And so we pause and say, okay, let's make sure that I understand the procedure of this or, um, you know, different de departmental, um, or not departments, but our, our different offices, what we're really focusing on. Um, and so we can take a step back. So that's also something to, really consider um, as we go into kind of how this applies to you is, and there's a whole slew of other things. You can go down the rabbit hole, but those are the, some of the key things that we thought that you want to be mindful of when considering how to apply this in your roles and on your campuses. So we say all this stuff about how UCF is doing all these things, um, but what does it really mean for you all? Um, so if you have a case management, a student of concern, or a behavioral intervention team, consider working individually and collaboratively with those folks on that team. Think about the partnerships that you have or could develop that could benefit the care of your students. Who does the work that you want to do already? So, for example, my team in my department may not all be counselors. They're all not behavioral intervention folks. We're res lifers, right? We, we know housing. We know how to care for the holistic student, and we really know how to be across different functional areas. But we, we have to consult Gabby and her crew. We have to say, hey, Let's figure out how we can do this better. How can we inform our policies better to provide that individualized support? So as you're thinking about that, really leveraging those partnerships and pulling those folks into your meetings to be able to collaboratively address things. Um, keep trying. Uh, that's hard to say because we're in a pandemic and that trying creates a lot of fatigue, but be mindful of your own mental health and the health of your students post pandemic. There's, we're going to eventually move out of a pandemic, right? And so our goal for this partnership was to continue to create an environment that fostered that care throughout the post-pandemic, right? Um, 2020 was tough for us, but ultimately it gave us the opportunity to grow. So think about how you can grow those opportunities on your campus. Maybe they didn't exist before the pandemic, but now is the time and opportunity to build on something that you're already doing right now. And as you do that, take account for your own intellectual and mental, intellectual energy and mental health. Um, now is the time to acknowledge what areas of your role and what areas of your partnerships are stress points that maybe need to be supported by thinking outside of your office. Think about all the technology that's currently available. Um, the pandemic highlighted all of the different technology that we have that can do this work. And think of ways that you could utilize that technology to connect with campus partners. So for Gabby and I, because we were meeting with each other all the time, we never really took note of, hey, there's this student we met with a year ago, but because my team doesn't necessarily have access to care, to care managers' case records, we didn't really know those things. So the OneDrive was our solution to be able to put all that information in a bucket that can be drawn upon later. Um, we are a Maxian campus, but due to medical records and, and things that are in those specific files, 
we want to student care services and myself both want to hold those things very close to our chest so that we are protecting those student records and so that one drive was really the way that we could just make sure that we're keeping track of all of those students and keeping track of all of the lessons that we're learning and things that we're seeing from that partnership so as you go to apply this, think of those things and think of how no matter your campus size, you can scale those aspects to be able to approach that work. So we have reached the end. And so we want you to contact us. We know that our presentation talked about a lot of different things and talked about a lot of different what ifs and, and how to's and, and maybe this might work, maybe it might not. So contact us, reach out. Um, these are both of our email addresses. Um, we are available via email. We are an email heavy school, so we will get back to you. Um, and we wanna open the floor for some questions that you might have at this time. All right, if there are no questions, we'll, Gabby and I will hang back. So feel free if you have some individualized questions to ask. Um, and we hope you have a great lunch and yeah. have a great day. And thank you for stopping by and like spending some time with us. Also yeah. appreciated. Yes. I added the eval back in the chat. Please, please, please remember to do that. And have a great day. Matthew says, can you repost the eval? Kayla. Yes, that is, that. Oh, thank that. you, appreciate okay. it. Hey, this is Matthew, I came on late. Uh, so I guess I was just asking, uh, so you all prepare these uh, touch points or baskets to give them. I came on at that slide uh, for yeah. students who need more concern, uh, isolation or somewhat of that sort. Yes. Yeah, so the way our process works is pre-pandemic, we really were a support and individual care management arm um, or partnership that was created between our two offices of student care services and uh, UCF Housing and Residence Life. Because we have students in our residence halls that might need a little bit more support and coaching through mental health crises, whether acute or persistent, right? And so pre-pandemic, that was our role, is really that student outreach and intervention. Um, Kayla, they're saying that the eval is not showing up for them. Yeah, I'm going to try to send it to them individually. Okay, perfect. Um, perfect. Work because I don't, I just have the one link, so I don't know why it's not working. Okay. Okay. Well, Matthew, to get back to your question. So that was originally what our partnership was. We started this partnership in February of 2019. So very young partnership between our two departments. Um, then, as we shifted into pandemic, we start noticing a lot more of the acute crises in terms of access, um, things like that. So, for example, with our office, when we have students who are in isolation, that's where our partnership kind of revved up to really provide some of those individual both bags for students in isolation um, who have to quarantine. Gabby talked about that those we call them busy bags. <laughs> they have different things from different offices and we provide that to every student who's, go who's in isolation or quarantine on our campus. Um, and then for our specific purposes, um, access wise, if they have food insecurity or things like that, we provide night's pantry bags to those students. We mm. already were doing that um, to students um, who were experiencing issues or support. So that was something that we were able to do further through our partnership. Yeah. So is, so is your food pantry, so you all had, uh, y'all went to go get the supplies from the food pantry prior to, like just to have bags already ready? 
Yeah, so Gabby, you want to talk about our yeah. replenishment process? Yes. Yeah. So um, how that works. So one, our pantry bags did exist um, some beforehand. There were some options for that. Um, our office, um, I knew kept a stash of them in our office at all times. So that way if a student came in and met with us and they had a need in that moment, um, we were able to give them some of those supplies. So yes, some of those bags um, did happen, but we also had a replenishing process um, that mm. also evolved as the pandemic progressed. Um, so mm. when we got to winter break, there was actually a stash in the conference room in the housing office of mm. um, one side was pantry bags and one side was busy bags. Um, so it really came down to what that need was. Um, and that's where a lot of that continued communication was really important um, because mm. at times it was, okay, we just got down to our last five busy bags and we know more is coming based off of the trend of what cases are looking like. How many can you get to us? Um, and so we had to figure out how many it was. And if it was my day to be on campus, then myself or my grad assistant would be able to drop them off to Brianna's office. Um, but there were a couple of times where it was like on a day that I wasn't going to be there for a couple of days to campus. And so right. we also or had to work I wasn't with there either, right? So yes. we got to get on the phone, play some phone tag and, and arrange yes. that. Yeah. Yeah, so we would work out so someone was able to deliver that. Um, the only time that we were not able to do a delivery was usually like on a weekend. So we would stock up sometimes on Friday if you were seeing a higher positivity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but obviously that takes multiple entities, right? So we not only have to contact our school pantry and say, hey, are y'all willing to give us a bunch of food? Which depending on their grant sourcing, they may or may not be able to, right? Um, depending on their funding, like how does that work? Are they able to outsource food that's not directly distributed through their office, right? So a lot of it is on like a, a handshake and a lean on the collaboration, right? Of we're going to responsibly distribute this food to students who need it. Um, so Gabby is right, that food is sitting in a conference room, which is kind of our staging area for isolation response. Um, but we had to really honor that partnership by be, by actually being responsive when we need things dropped off, um, when school is closed, the pantry is closed. So really being able to rely on those things. Hmm. Okay. Thank you.